Welcome back. You're watching the CNBC TV 18 special and we're discussing Prime Minister Modi's visit to the U.S. What about immigration reforms? And once again, uh, you know, the Obama administration is uncertain about whether they're going to be able to push this bill in its current avatar or in a watered-down, diluted avatar or not. Uh, it looks like it's been pushed back even further. Do you anticipate any convergence of India's concerns as far as the immigration reform process is concerned? I think that... that remains a sticking point. Uh, there are some recommendations in the volume on how to move this forward, particularly making it easier for, for Indians who have received American degrees uh, to enter the workforce as, as a way to sort of do a halfway house. That if, you, if you've studied in the U.S., presumably yeah. you, you, you know, you, you paid a fee, you, you've contributed to the economy in some direct way, uh, does that then mean that you can you have a slightly higher entitlement to work as opposed to coming indirectly? Mm. Uh, I think there are two issues here. One is there is of course no political uh, consensus on this. The Senate has passed the bill, the sure. House is not, so we don't know where it's going to move. But the other is uh, the, the complex nature of, of work arrangements. I mean, let's not forget that you know U.S. companies have massive numbers of people working in India. These yeah. are back office functions, mostly the services. IBMs of the world. Uh, yeah. And I think that the the attitude uh, uh, you can you can see where this is coming from is you know we, we have exported so many jobs mm. there. Mm. How come you you want to sort of take that one step further? So I think there is a uh, there is a sensitivity that uh, that needs to be recognized. Uh, but Bottom do you anticipate any pragmatic solutions here as well? Uh, because, you know, we've talked about this H-1B visa cap done in a week uh, when once it opens up. Yeah. Well, you know, if you look at the past, when President Clinton was president, and again, because there was a period of unemployment and initially and sluggishness in the economy, they were again tightening up on the B-1 visas and H-1B visas and so on. And... Um, the whole process, uh, we were able to engage in the process, and there was an extended discussion on it. And during that period, the economy revived mm. in the U.S. Unemployment went down, and suddenly they were looking for increasing the caps because they desperately needed, needed. people yeah. to come. Yeah. So if you look now, unemployment in the U.S., which was in the region of 10%, is now near the 6% Six Six benchmark. Yeah. So in that sense, there is a kind of more sustained recovery in the U.S. economy. And as this gathers momentum, so be more need you will see that the polemics around the issue and the sensitivities around the issue perhaps come down. Mm. As it is, U.S. companies are stressing that they are short of technically qualified manpower. They have huge gaps which they need to fill. Bilateral investment treaty, do you believe that we could perhaps see some conclusive move towards a timeline uh, on this visit? Uh, again, that's going to be one of the challenging sort of issues. Uh, and I'm not quite sure whether we'll see kind of forward movement on that necessarily. Uh, and there's also been some issues of saying whether that is in fact uh, equally beneficial. Mm. And so something whether it's worth investing in politically or not at this juncture. Mm. Would you agree? Do you believe that... Uh, uh, you let know, me put it like this. I think the emphasis on this visit should really be on the areas where there are opportunity. Okay. I think there are a number of ongoing discussions. One is a bilateral investment treaty uh, for the economic side. One was the possibility of doing a study to look at the costs and benefits of a free trade area. These are ongoing. Mm. Uh, I think where we have opportunity... One is in the field of defense, mm. because if you look at uh, what has happened, on the one side you have India increasing the ceiling for FDI in defense to 49%, yeah. and also taking the first decision to encourage private sector right. participation in defense in terms of the Avro replacement. Mm. Uh, the, and at the same time, you have the U.S., uh, you know, under the joint declaration which was signed last year, uh, say that they will treat India on par with their closest partners mm -hmm. for purposes of defense trade, transfer of defense technology, joint research, co-production, sure. co-development. And when Defense Secretary um, Mr. Hegel had come to India, 
this was really something which he said that we would try to see how we can help mm. India's efforts at indigenizing uh, its defense production. So do you so, believe that this will be the single biggest area of opportunity well, and we may actually see whether it's MOUs or you know some some sort of concrete tangible action See on there this are front. about 12 proposals a dozen or so proposals under consideration but I think we need to try and work out which one and then we might also have an agreement to negotiate a fresh framework defense agreement mm -hmm. because that expires next year, the 10 years give over next year. And so we need to have a fresh agreement for that. So I think that's a very real area of opportunity. The second would be clean energy, as yeah. mentioned by Mr. Sidhu, because if you look at India's um, objectives, uh, to have 20,000 megawatts of solar power by 2022. And then we would also like to have wind energy, geothermal, mm. biofuels, uh, and so on. Right. Uh, and energy efficiency. I think that offers huge opportunities because U.S. companies are at the cutting edge in many of these areas. Sure. Um, and uh, then you look at areas like health and education. There's certainly areas which hold a great deal of deal. promise for joint collaboration. So I think we could structure mm. a fairly strong uh, basket. Then you look at the 100 new smart cities City. proposal. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it plays to U.S. advantage. And let me start by asking you and get wrap-up comments. What would he have to do, Prime Minister Modi, in the U.S. and President Barack Obama to qualify this visit as a success? Well, I think, uh, first of all, we probably don't want to narrowly look at this as just between President Obama sure. and Prime Minister Modi, in the sense that there are other very uh, key actors within the U.S. who it would be interesting to see how they respond to the visit as well. Among them, the corporates. Second, the Congress, uh, which actually is turning out to be a you know, bipartisan support of India right across. John McCain was here. The Republicans, as well as the Democrats, are quite supportive of that and the diaspora. Mm. Uh, so I think in some ways, you know, the administration and the bilateral dimension is only going to be a part of it. Mm. Uh, but there I think the fundamental marker uh, would not necessarily be the kind of deals that we've become accustomed to, like mm. the Indo-US nuclear deal, because right. that sort of should be once in a decade. Sure. You can't have that every visit. But I think more fundamentally, if the two leaders can mark out a very clear roadmap as to where they see these two countries going mm. uh, and moving it back up to the strategic straight, uh, you know, strata, I think that would be a fundamental marker. And then everything else will mm. sort of flow and follow from there. Very little known fact, there are nearly 30 dialogues between India and the U.S. today. Many of them are going on quite uh, successfully without any uh, kind of markers, etc. So I think th those issues are there. Some issues are stuck. If there's forward movement in some of those issues, mm. but more fundamentally, if the two leaders can provide the strategic direction mm. as to what this relationship is going to look like in five years' right. time, I think that would be a critical marker. What would be a critical marker for you, Mira Shankar? Well, I think the ability to focus on three or four clear areas of convergence and areas of potential mutual benefit. I think defense is clearly one sector because India wants to build its defense production base and we need to multiply our options in this regard. Not that the U.S. will become the exclusive supplier, sure. but the scope to expand is great as it is from a position where we were buying hardly any defense equipment from the U.S. We've now placed orders for about $9 billion worth of equipment, so we've seen exponential growth. Um, the second uh, major area I would see, say is counter-terrorism mm. because both countries have an interest in, uh, 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 you know, uh, store in, in holding back or in um, stopping the tide of extremism and terrorism. Sure. How do they strengthen their ability to work together? Mm. And more specifically, if I may say, you know, if you look at the India-Pakistan relationship, then any major incident like Mumbai could be a major setback to the relationship. So it's clearly in the interest of the two countries, countries. to strengthen their intelligence and information sharing sure. so that 
they are able to head off the possibility of such an incident and, and that to the extent possible. The and priority. the third would be to look at the whole rubric of economic opportunity in terms of infrastructure development in India, both renewable energy, mm. uh, energy efficiency, the smart cities, modernization of railways. There's a whole new ball game out there which would play to U.S. advantage. Mm. And I would really advise U.S. companies, yes, you have your grievances, but don't miss, the wood. The, don't miss the wood for the trees. Please. Uh, Shubhi Rokhan, I'm going to end this with you. $35 billion from Japan, $20 billion from China. What do you anticipate here? I, I don't think we should be doing the bean <laughs> counting here. Uh, the $35 billion and the $20 billion are all contingent on many things being Sorry. done domestically. And that's what the government needs to focus on. How do you create uh, a conducive investment climate so that you know anybody who wants to put money in does? I think the main... Uh, the foundation of this relationship going forward is knowledge. Uh, knowledge transfers are critical and they have different manifestations in different sectors. Mm -hmm. I think if we can agree that the foundation is, is based on knowledge, I think we then open up uh, the opportunity to, to progress on many of the issues on which there are, there are clearly common interests. Uh, but uh, there, there are also, you know, points of friction and resistance. Well, let's hope that there is more convergence than friction on this. Visit Meera Shankar, Shubhi Gokharan and Mr. Sidhu. Appreciate you joining us here on this special conversation on CNBC TV 18. Remember, do tune into CNBC TV 18 as we track all the action from Washington, D.C. and New York right here live for you every day starting the 23rd. Till then, from all of us here, goodbye and many thanks for watching.